Gordon Banks I Stand. This is, of course, a different tune than the traditional <laughs> song. We don't sing this a lot, but I thought it'd be a good song to sing today. After this song, Travis will lead us in our uh, prayer before class. <laughs> Lord of stormy banks, I stand and cast a wishful eye to Cana's fair and happy land where black possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land, the promised land, I am bound for the promised land. Sermon on the Mount, we will continue with our study about fruitful prayer this morning. We started that, I think, week before last, and it, it's a really good discussion, and I think that's one reason I'm not trying to rush through it too much. When we talk about our prayer life, it's such a significant part of our spiritual life, because I don't want to say this the right way, we, we should, every day, make time to spend time with God. We talked about the definition of prayer. Part of that is a petition to God, a communion with God. One uh, definition was an appeal of the soul to God. It's our communication to Him. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be formal necessarily. But it, it's our communication, our communion 
it's it's how we in, in a little bit of a form at least relate to him. Uh, he doesn't speak to us directly today like he did in the past but he still speaks and we have so much of it recorded here for us to look at and understand the problem is sometimes we don't spend enough time doing that either because it's important that we pray but it's important that we study and it's difficult in today's time and in today's society to find time to do that. Uh, the world crowds in, Satan crowds in. He, he pushes the things of God aside. He, he tends to try to fill our minds and our time with other things. And these are some of the problems that we contend with as we think about our prayer life. And I think I've said this once before. I've heard it said several times if you want to humble someone that thinks they're pretty well off, ask them about their prayer life. Because most of us, if we're honest, will admit it's probably short, <clears throat> especially when we compare it to some of the examples that we have in Scripture of God's leaders, the men that he chose to be leaders, and their prayer life, and how they communicated with the men around them, men and women around them, but how they communicated with God. Uh, we talked about prayer as a barometer of faith and of love and of humility and commitment and gratitude. And I think it is a barometer of all of these things and probably much more, but that was just what the, the book called as specific things to compare. And we talked about briefly, we could talk probably several weeks on Jesus' prayer life, but we talked about he, he spent a significant time of his life on earth in prayer, communicating with the Father. And he spent time specifically, the ones that we talked about, was when he chose the twelve, and when he decided to, to, be, to spread his ministry would be the way I would term it, to move from this location and continue to move and continue to take it to other people in other locations. And then we talked about the, the prayer that he had on the night before his betrayal. Uh, and the, that, or the night of his betrayal, I should say. Uh, that is a significant time, of course, in his life, but it's a significant time in his prayer life also because he was in, in spiritual and I think in physical distress because he knew what lay ahead of him and he knew what needed to be done and yet he was willing to endure all of that and that was part of his prayer he would not impose his will he would accept god's will and he would do what god desired be done for humanity and i think this is one of the problems that we struggle with sometimes and one of the daily devotionals that i read one time brought this to point and i hadn't thought about it exactly it's really easy to say that Jesus died for the world, and he did. It's really easy to say that he died for the salvation of mankind, and he did. But when you say he died a, a terrible, painful, miserable death on the cross for me. Now, he did it for the world. He did it for you. But pull it home and say he did it for me. That makes it a little more personal. And you think about that a little more closely and you relate to that a little more closely if you make it on that personal level rather than just saying in the broad terms. And, and it's true, but he also died for the individual. And that individual in this case is me. And that's one reason it's such a significant sacrifice because it impacts me directly in so many ways. Uh, we were down to Acts chapter 10 uh, in verse 4. Travis, would you read Acts chapter 10? And I, I should have marked this. I know we need at least verse 4. And when he observed him, he was afraid and said, What is it, Lord? So he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have come up, and come up for a memorial before God. Okay, and, and I apologize. I should have picked up a verse ahead of that. He's talking about Cornelius. Uh, and Cornelius is a very interesting character. Uh, and he was a Roman centurion. 
And I did not understand what a Roman centurion was exactly, but he, of course, is over a hundred men. He's the commander over a hundred men. The modern equivalent, according to what I read, would be roughly that of a sergeant major. Uh, and he was uh, in, in charge of these men. And in that day and time and in that army, he had control of them. And if we remember the centurion that came to Christ, he said, I, I have authority and I say to this one go and this one come and they do what I say, which tells me he had authority over them. Uh, they, were, they were not necessarily reckless. Uh, they were very calculating. They were very steady leaders was one way that they put it. They were prudent, not prone to start fighting wantonly, but if necessary, they would stand fast and die at their post because that was their job. That was what they were trained to do. He exhibited courage and loyalty. Now you think about those characteristics and we're gonna talk about his prayer life in just a moment, but courage and loyalty. And he had become weary of the idolatrous people around him. Now you think of the time that he lived in and the nature of society that he lived in and the idolatry and the immoralities and the things that were commonplace in his world and the things that he saw and lived with around him because he was a Roman and of course his troops were Romans and so he lived with them and he saw this every day and yet he sought God. He apparently went to the synagogue. Uh, he was a man that feared God, it says. And so because of this, he was a compassionate man. He gave to the people in need. There's some question, depending on where you read and what you read, did he give to the Jewish nation or did he give to everyone? And I'm not 100% sure, it doesn't really say, it just said he gave alms to the needy that would indicate probably to the Jew, but possibly to others as well. Uh, so he was a charitable man. He was compassionate. He cared about his fellow man, which is almost a contradiction when you think about his military service. But he had that kind of heart and, and the loyalty and the honesty and the integrity. And it also says he was a man of prayer. And I find that interesting it doesn't indicate that he was a proselytized Jew. It just indicates that he was a man of prayer. He understood that God existed because he knew the Jewish people around him and he understood that prayer was how they communicated with him. And so he is commended for that. And it's interesting in the way that they did that. It says that his prayers came up to God as a memorial. Now, I hadn't thought about this exactly in this term, but when we think of people and when we think of people's desires to be memorialized, what do you think of? I think of a statue or a building or a highway or something that's named after them. That, that's something that's permanent. That's a memorial that lasts longer than they do. What kind of memorial did Cornelius have? <clears throat> Through his prayers, but where? With God. With God. Now you talk about a permanent memorial, you know, a statue or a highway or a building, that's a long-term thing, but you talk about something that is permanent. Uh, his, his prayers and, and his generosity, his, his love for his fellow man went to God as a memorial to him. Uh, it, it's interesting the, the phrase and the, and the words that they use that to come up before God, um, it can be fulfilled by prayers offered to and ascending to God's throne. And it's interesting because it says that Cornelius was a God seeker and he was also a God fearer. 
Now you stop and think about that, and when someone describes you, do they describe you as someone that fears God and as someone who seeks God? And that's how he was described, and that's how he's remembered because of those characteristics. Uh, and God heard those prayers, and he answered these prayers. And as we talked about, his memorial was going to be in heaven. Now, what was his... What was his immediate reward for that? And I, I'm probably stretching this a little bit, but why did the angel appear to him? He needed salvation. He needed salvation. Now, were his prayers and his almsgiving sufficient? No. They were not. And we think about, okay, he was a good man, he was a kind man, he was a compassionate man, he was an honest man, he was a loyal man, he was trustworthy. All of these good characteristics that we think about, and yet was that sufficient? He still lacked something, didn't he? He still lacked the obedience that would be necessary when he found out what to do, he was obedient. But at this point, he was still lacking. Yes, ma'am. It's interesting to me that it's not just his prayers that we pay the memorial, his actions. And so there is never, ever approval of God without an action. <coughs> People who say, just pray this prayer and you're saved. Oh, no. It requires more than that, doesn't it? But always it's linked. What you do, mm -hmm. you know, God doesn't just judge you for your prayers, but by your actions. And and I, I think that it's been addressed because it says if you just pray, well, you know, be warm and be filled and go your way, but you don't do anything to help that person. How significant is that? It, it's not that. It requires something on his part, something that needed to be done. <laughs> At this point in his life, he didn't know what he needed to do. But God recognized the fact that he would be receptive. I may be interpreting this completely wrong, but I think God saw Cornelius as the, as the perfect vessel by which Peter could come and open those doors into that Gentile world because he was respected not only in the Roman aspect of it, but I think the Jews saw him and recognized the, the credibility, maybe the right way to say it, of the life that he lived. In this day and time, that was significant because it was not very many people that lived the kind of life that I believe he lived. And I've never been a soldier, but I suspect that being a soldier can lead to a lot of other issues and a lot of other problems that some of us don't see because you're taken away from your family, you're taken away from your surroundings, you're taken away from the support group that you had and maybe thrust into some places that are not the right type of, of experience and the right type of living in the right examples. And yet Cornelius lived the life that he thought God would be interested in him living and he did his best through prayer. And of course that's the study that we're doing, it's about prayer. And I think these prayers were significant in that God recognized them and, and I believe he answered them by sending Peter to him and sending him to bring him the rest of the information that he needed so he could be obedient, so he could actually come to Christ and have the opportunity for salvation that he wasn't going to have following the path that he was already on. How significant was prayer to him? It was, wasn't it? Uh, it, it changed his life, literally, because of the prayers that he offered and the generosity, as we just said, it wasn't just his prayer life, it was his actions also. And I'm, I'm not sure, no matter how good and charitable you are, if you don't have the right kind of prayer life, I'm not sure that that's gonna be very beneficial. 
but your prayer life is not going to be as beneficial as it should be if you don't have those other things in your life also. I think we need to be careful, and I think I, I don't want anybody to get the wrong impression. You can't buy salvation. It's just not possible. We don't have enough. We can't give enough. We can't be good enough. But at the same time, salvation requires our actions. And I think that's what Cornelius is an example of. Because it required him not only to live that prayerful life, but to live the life that he needed to to help other people. You know, what his prayers in the description that we have there about Cornelius in the early part of the chapter, the fact that he prays indicates, number one, that he believes in God. Mm -hmm. So he's got faith. He's still not saved. He's got a religion. Yeah. God prays. He believes in God. He does those things for good. And he's still not saved. I mean, it's just a great lesson against so much of the false teaching that exists today. And his prayer life indicates, I think, <coughs> the good qualities that he had in regards to his relationship with God. You know, if 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 his salvation was dependent with you know upon the old law or <coughs> patriarchal dispensation, he probably would have stood, had been in good standings with the Lord. But now that Christ has died, he's required to come to Christ. So all of those things indicate that he was a good man, he was a religious man, he had faith, all of those things that people today say save you, mm -hmm. except baptism, you know, uh, indicates that, uh, that there's still something lacking in his life. And I think that's such a significant <clears throat> lesson, buddy. Because, you know, in his life, we look at him and he appears to be an example of a God-fearing, and as it says, a God-fearing, God-seeking, uh, compassionate, prayerful, generous, all of those good things. But that, in, that alone wasn't enough. He still lacked that one thing. Uh, and as you said, so many times today, we hear all you got to do is pray and all you got to do is do this and that, well... Yeah, that's part of it, but there's more than that one part, and that's not enough on its own. Question number seven is an interesting question. Uh, Luke, Eric, would you read Luke 9, 29, please, sir? <clears throat> Luke 9, 29. As he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered, and it became white and glistening. Now this is, of course, on the Mount of Transfiguration, and it, it's a miraculous occurrence, obviously. The question is, is it possible for people to see the effects of prayer on us? Now, when, when he was praying, his appearance changed because on this mount, he was transfigured. He changed, his physical appearance changed, and the apostles that were with him saw that change, and they recognized that. You know, that, that's clear. It, it's significant. My question is, can they see the effects of prayer on us? Yes. Yeah. Only through your actions. Okay. I, physically from the results from the results from your actions physically do I change because I pray or don't pray I can't look at someone and say well you pray a lot and you don't pray as much I, I can't do that can I can they see it from the life we live and the actions and the the result of prayer sometimes because those are the things that tell, in my mind and in my, in my belief, do you pray or not? And does God answer those prayers? Yes. Does he always give me the answer I want? No. Sometimes it's a blessing that he didn't give me the answer that I wanted. But that, that prayer life is still significant even though my face doesn't change and my clothes don't change. Uh, I, I thought about this some. Um, Peter, James, and John saw the change in Christ, and, and they saw that as a result of his prayer to God. Are we perceived as a people who pray? And you think about the perception of people around you. 
I'll use this in as an example, and it's not necessarily about prayer, but it's about the Christian life. If you walk up to a table and they're middle, in the middle of a story and they stop telling that story when you walk up, what, what does that say about the quality of that story that they may have been telling? It might not have been a good one, but they recognize that you might not want to hear that. They recognize that you might not want to participate in that. Uh, do people ask you to pray for them or their family? Do people offer to pray for you? I, I think all of these things tell about the perception of people around us. Can people see that I pray? I don't think they can see it necessarily, but I think they recognize it. And I think they recognize that, and I've had a couple of people who had sick friends, relatives, whatnot, call me and say, would you pray for and, and give me their name? Uh, because they do know that I am a Christian and they do know that I pray and they do know I don't have a, a hotline to God or anything, but they know that I'm prayerful and they know that I live the kind of life that I'm going to be in communication with God. And they ask me to do that on their behalf or on their family or friends' behalf. Eric, did you? No, I look at that, I guess the question a little bit different. And it said, is it possible for people to see the effects prayer has on us? I, I, I agree, we can't see who's praying, who's not. But if we have a the prayer life we should, our attitude should be different. Our countenance should be different. People should be able to tell that we are a prayerful person through the effects the prayers have. Uh, I believe that wholeheartedly, that if the joy that we should be expressing day to day, if our prayer life is not right, we're probably not going to be portraying the right image, the right attitude. There's going to be things wrong in our life. If we're, not, if we're spending time with God every day, I believe people can see that. Uh, they, they may not know why we're the way we are, but I do believe it's there. And sometimes, if nothing else, that may make a mask. Correct. Uh, because and, and I think, too, you, you look back to uh, in, a, in the Old Testament it was Hannah. She was praying, and her countenance was very, very sad because she was praying for something specific she wasn't given, but they could see the effects there uh, originally she was sad or countenance low but once she finally got the point that she prayed and gave it to God they can see a difference in her mm -hmm. and it was strictly because of the prayers that she gave to God and as she said I'm I'm fine with whatever the answer is finally and and I agree people should be able to see that in our lives shouldn't yeah. they but no I don't believe that if we stand up and pray and all of a sudden we're going to light up people are going to see that <laughs> We're, we're not going to do that. But I do believe that the, that the effects of the prayer better be able to be seen in our lives. And and may, maybe not only on me, but on who else? Everybody around us. Everybody around us. And I think that that's in, important also. It's not just my livelihood or my health or my issues. Do the people around me recognize that and see that and, and does it show on them also? I think you're exactly right. But in line with what Eric said, you know, I just can't believe that people go around with a perpetual frown on their face in a bad mood or purple people. I just don't believe that. It makes you wonder, doesn't it? Because you know, obviously prayer is a result of faith and belief in God. If we have faith, if we understand that God's, you know, that's like Eric said. That creates a very positive attitude in us. I, I just I think that people who smile all the time, they probably are prayerful people. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, you know all the time that they're right with God, but I'm just saying people in a bad mood are just not prayerful people with their bad mood all the time, negative all the time. Uh, I just don't seem to have faith in God at all. You know? Yes, sure. I think it goes along with I know we're about to say we're not going to glow, but we are to let our light shine. And sometimes we're the only Bible people read, so it goes right along with that. They will see us and want to teach through our actions, not just through our mouth. So I think that goes right along with that, letting the light shine. And uh, hopefully that transfers somehow.
and I, I, I think you're exactly right. Uh, get back to you. I, I want to go back to what we just said a while ago. That's part of that action, isn't it? People see that. They recognize that. That that's if if you go around with a frown on your face all the time and you never speak to anybody and you never are seen doing anything, that light's not shining very much, is it? Uh, but I think that's exactly how we do display that. That's one of the ways. Travis, I'm sorry. No, I was just thinking about what Eric had said here a second ago. In Philippians chapter 4, he said, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. When we talk about this question being you know, the effects of prayer, a lack of anxiety and peace are both very, like, those are things that people see. That's not just an internal to yourself thing. When you see somebody that is not anxious, even though they're in a stressful situation, when they have a peace that doesn't seem like it ought to be natural, you know, you're having a, a rough time in your life, but I can see that you're at peace with that, and those things come by prayer, those are very visible things. Those, those effects of that prayer that we put before God are very apparent to those around us, so they should be. You know, because we can see those times where those things get to people and they they have a lot of anxiousness. They do not have a peace that God's going to take care of it. But also those things, when we do have that, those are very apparent. Those are very evident to those people around us. And so when I was reading that question, you know, is it possible to see the effects of that? Well, Philippians chapter 4 would make it very clear, in my opinion, that they should be. <clears throat> I think part of that depends on how well you know somebody. Uh, and because of that, you may know what's going on in their life a little more or maybe not so much. Uh, but I think you're exactly right. If you see somebody and as Betty said, if they've got a frown on their face all the time, you have to wonder, does that person not have any faith? Do they not have any, any prayer life, any communication with God? <clears throat> do they not have that peace that he offers us Is that always an easy task to accomplish, that peaceful feeling? <laughs> I think that's one of our struggles. What does that require? Faith, that's exactly right. You know, prayer is important, and if you have a prayer life, you probably have faith or you wouldn't be praying, but it takes that faith to accept that, okay, God's in charge. He's going to take care of this. He'll provide what I need when I need it. Is it, is it what I ask for sometimes? Not necessarily. But he's going to, he's going to take care of me. He says he will. And, and that's when faith comes in. You know, faith covers a lot of these things because you accept that he will do that, but you also accept how he does it. And sometimes the how is the most difficult part because it's not what I planned and it certainly didn't fit the pattern that I had. Billy? I think in the last several years, few years, we've all been witness to those in our families, our church families that have had tragedies, had very stressful situations. And after those things happen, to see their faith come through with that peace. And when I said that long ago, I thought of several examples in my mm -hmm. head that, you know, I know that we've all witnessed that to where people, you're like, oh, they're really hailing that well. And then when they come out with some of the scriptural things that they say, it's like, that's the kind of peace we need to have. And, and you see them in faith. back in worship services, and you see them back participating, and you see them back in the role they were in before doing those things, uh, even after adversity and, and maybe a significant amount of yeah. adversity. There's been some bad ones in the last few years, and to see people's reactions come back after that, mm -hmm. it's, it's certainly an example to all of us that if that happens to me, I want to be like that. I want to turn it over to God and not let that, let, let me try to handle it, but let God handle it. So. And I'm going to go negative on this, but sometimes you see the opposite happen, don't you? You, you see people that lose faith because right. of those Even negative ourselves, you know, we can be falling into that. Mm -hmm. we, we forget when we human we forget but you're like you know then those around us again those around us keep us 
is where we need to be. So that that's the the strength of the family, isn't it? Uh, it is to sometimes to encourage. Sometimes they literally pull us along because we need that, yeah. and sometimes we can pull somebody else. While this works, we're here to congregate for a reason. And it's not just one reason, but that's one of many things. Mm -hmm. We're here to support one another and having that to hold us up. To, to continually do that. Yes, yeah, sir. Sure. Alan, I think a lot of it has to do with uh, we are, you know, you have the saying, you are what you eat, what you put into yourself. If you're not, you can have a, you can sit there and you can pray, you know, as much as the next person, but if you aren't consuming, the word and you aren't consuming uh, what you need to to have that complete relationship with God, those prayers are never going to get you to a point where you can experience that peace. I mean, we, we practice, you know, in school, we practice a fire drill or a tornado drill, but how often do you prepare for when Satan comes into your life? You know, you have to have both aspects of that in order to achieve that peace in your heart, that peace in your body. Good point. Uh, it, we, we practice for physical adversity, don't we? Uh, but how often through our prayers do we practice for those spiritual adversities that come along? Uh, and that, that, that's something that sometimes we fall short in. And because of that, when those things hit, we struggle, sometimes stumble and fall because we haven't practiced. We haven't built that reaction that we should have. That's exactly right. Uh, Proverbs 28.9. Ken, would you read Proverbs 28.9, please? <clears throat> Proverbs 28, verse 9. One heard, turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. And the question is, can prayer be substituted for obedience? I, I, I know from what that says, it cannot. Do we sometimes try to do that, though? And, and we struggle with this sometimes because our prayer life, we hope, is growing and it's going to continue to improve the communication is going to continue to be there but do we always <coughs> want to be obedient and i think this was what cornelius found he had a, i would say had a good prayer life but he wasn't he wasn't completely obedient because he didn't know what to do he didn't have the rest of the obedience that he needed to have now what was his reaction when he found that out, immediately took care of it. he immediately took care of it. And, and to me, that speaks to what quality of prayer life he had because he had that fear of God. He had that desire, that yearning. When he found out what to do, did he say, oh, I'll check you later or come back and no. He didn't schedule it for two months down the road he, to have a big service. On yeah, Sunday. we're, we're going to have a special deal on you know July seventeenth or what? No, he took care of it right then, and and so the obedience part of it then becomes significant <laughs> combined with prayer. I, that's the way I would put it. Uh, the prayer is important. The obedience is important, but you need to combine those things together. Uh, and by combining those things together. We'll never be perfect, but it brings us closer to the perfection that he asks us to seek and the, and the perfection that he wants us to try to attain. And so, you know, that obedience is important and so is the prayer life. Uh, the last question is an interesting question. How did Jonah misuse the purpose of prayer? Now we think about the story of Jonah and God called Jonah to go do what? <laughs> to save Nineveh, to preach to them that if you don't, as Cash would say, if you don't straighten up, I'm going to destroy this city. Okay. What was his reaction to that? He ran away worse he, he, he ran away. Not only did he run away, he ran the opposite direction, didn't he? 
He didn't want any part of that, which I find strange when, when God came to him and told him to do this. It's strange to me that that was his reaction. And yet, after some encouragement, when he had a second chance, he went to Nineveh. Now, and this is interesting to me, he was a stranger in the city. He comes in with a message, we'd call it a message of doom and gloom, a message of, you know, y'all are lost, you have no chance, change your ways or else. Now, how would we react to that? I'm going to tell you that it would be pretty difficult to accept that, and yet what did the people in Nineveh do? <coughs> they repented and responded completely as God wanted them to, not as Jonah expected, I don't think, but he, he preached the truth and gave them the information. They made the decision to, to react appropriately, and what was Jonah's reaction to that? He was mad. Now, I, it just dumbfounds me that he goes, he obviously knows God because God has spoken to him and sent him on a mission. He has to have the three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish in his mind to see the power of God and the providence of God and the ability of God because not only did he spend three days and nights there he came out of it, I would say, unscathed physically. Now, emotionally, I'm not so sure, but physically he came out all right. And so he goes and does what God sends him to do, and these people have the opportunity to do what? To know God the way he does, to see God's salvation the way he has. And yet his, his reaction is so contrary so what it should have been, and I, I don't know that this is right or not, but I, I, he, I, my, I said that he prayed because he was displeased with God for showing mercy. And he seemed sad that the people of Nineveh repented to avoid the punishment. Now, the question in my mind was, did Jonah seek what was best for Nineveh, or did he seek what would save his own ego? And, and you stop and think about prayer, and it's a vital tool, it's an important tool. It, it, is, it should be significant in every Christian's life, as well as the actions that, in this case, that he exhibited to go and do what God sent him to do. And yet, how sad it is that this was the reaction that he has and the prayer that he prayed, because it, it didn't end the way he wanted it to or he didn't end the way he expected it to, but he said, I knew you were a good God and you were merciful and I, I knew this was gonna happen. I don't know why you wasted my time. Uh, and that's sad to have that kind of an outlook when that many people actually were saved because of the message that he took to them. Eric? I think sometimes we find ourselves somewhat like him and that we may pray for those that do us wrong, but deep down, we're hoping God gives them what they deserve. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we, we may do what's right and pray that they change, but I think sometimes deep down we're hoping before they change, I hope that they really get taught a good lesson. Do we, do we really? Do change, you think I'm coming back. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do we really want justice or are we looking for revenge? Exactly. <laughs> And and that's that's the question, and I think that was on his mind too. Uh, any other comments or questions? I think Billy's fixing to hit the bell. I guess he did. Oh, he did. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. Next week we're going to have a guest speaker. The week after that we're going to come back and talk about fasting. I don't know about that. I'm not going to be here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to skip that class. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.